Okay, to share some insights from our project, may I now call upon Professor E. K. Yeo, Director, Center for Health Systems and Policy Research, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Thank you. Deputy uh, Under Secretary Dr. Li Bili, uh, Mr. Tay, Samuel Chen, Professor Tuan, Professor Wong, our uh, partners, uh, colleagues, and friends. It's a great uh, privilege for me to have this opportunity to share with you uh, some of our uh, perspectives of this project, uh, some of the initial work we've done, and, and uh, to be able to speak on behalf of our uh, NGO partners uh, on the progress so far. Um, the, the project obviously has been uh, very generously funded by uh, Jockey Club Charities Trust, uh, and, uh, and uh, you have already heard the, the, the uh, great work that has been um, okay. go slide oh, Jim, okay. no. Okay. So the, the, the project looks at health inequalities among uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, it's a three year pilot working with uh, our ethnic minority families uh, for better health. Uh, obviously, there are many language barriers, socioeconomic disadvantages, low accessibility to health services, low health literacy. And how can these be changed? We approach it from a multicultural, multidisciplinary team representing social medical integration and the community academic partnership. The project looks at seamless feedback between research interventions and programs. We do a lot of academic work and I think it's important to do this because it, it, uh, the, the research informs policy. And I think the evidence base that we will generate from this research uh, will better uh, enable us to see what could be done in the future. So when we look at some of the work in, that we need to look at, uh, these are the so-called pathways for behavioral influence on health and injury. So it's not just about individual behaviors, because for individual health behaviors, it, you require uh, some predispo predisposing factors. So the person's health literacy, cap capacity, understanding, beliefs are the only just predisposing factors. But there are also enabling factors in society that will enable people to act on those uh, uh, predisposing factors. So these are the things that we're looking for in this project. We're looking at what are these enabling factors in policies, in the environment, in the community support, and also in terms of the reinforcing factors. So it reinforces effects from families, from peers, from policy, from health workers. So this is the concept that we are working on. So it's not just the, the pathways, but also how do we generate knowledge uh, from, from this uh, framework that we're able then to improve the health of our ethnic minorities. Now, of course, this framework doesn't apply just for ethnic minorities. It applies for all. And it, it, it involves a lot of different uh, uh, methods and qualitative methods in, in, uh, in in health promotion and, and health improvements, uh, which combines uh, the methods from ethnography, from anthropology, from biostatistics. So there's a whole range of things that we work on. So we look at this seamless feedback between research interventions, evaluation and programs. So this is the continuous process. In the next uh, eight minutes or so, I'll share with you the work that we're doing, the, the concepts that we have and carried on so far. This is Ms. Shisa in the Empower journey with, the, uh, with this project. Uh, this, uh, this lady is a 40-year-old uh, Pakistani uh, lady uh, that has been living in Hong Kong for eight years. She's a homemaker and she's married with two children. So she's very typical. We, we have now done 374 uh, health assessments so far in the, this very short project. So Emel will be very happy. We're making excellent progress with, with the team that we have in the partnership. Uh, it, this has been really quite amazing. So you see that she's representative of the population that we've assessed so far. Most of them are, are below 40, many are women, 
uh, about half are Pakistani, uh, 29% are Nep Nepalese, Indians constitute 11, and then others. Uh, most of them have integrated over the last seven years. They're mostly married with many children. And then the educational standards are usually um, not, not, have not achieved very high. And they also uh, have relatively modest uh, incomes of below 20,000. And many of them are in public housing. So these are what I think Professor Tran, uh, because of his passion in social terms of health and health inequalities, looks at these determinants in terms of how people uh, uh, can be healthy. So in, in this journey that we have constructed for Mishisa and for uh, ethnic minorities, we, our first step is looking at awareness of health risks and awareness of health services and health literacy, moving on to how they can utilize health services, healthy lifestyle. So on two, one side would be the environmental factors, the social factors, on the other side would be health factors, then leading to better outcomes and eventually a voice in health to uh, Ms. Dr. Libby Lee. So this is uh, our assessment. This is the first time that, uh, that she was aware that she's obese and has high cholesterol. And in our health assessments, uh, most of the adults, in fact, um, uh, were overweight, and many of them were obese, and many over 80% had central obesity. And for, for um, uh, the medical staff, the public health staff here, obviously central BC has a very high uh, uh, risk for uh, cardiovascular disease, more than general BC. So these are the breakdowns in terms of the various age groups. You can see that uh, almost uh, 30 to 40 percent of, the, of these uh, ladies have quite significant uh, obesity. And when we did health assessment of these uh, 374 adults, hypertension, diabetes, and hypercholesterolemia were much higher than uh, the general population. And more alarmingly, obviously, uh, they were previously undiagnosed. So between 50 to 80% of these were not diagnosed previously. So we've now looked at, they're now aware of the health risks. So how, how do we then move on for them to be to access health services and in terms of the health literacy? Because as we said, that knowing doesn't mean that you're going to do, right? So these are just the, the, the factors that we support them in terms of supporting their predisposing factors and then to then look at what are the enabling factors for them then to move on to the next step of accessing health care. So when we have a nurse consultation that gives health advice and then connect services. So HA has the HA goal, which uh, Dr. Libby Lee, I think she was part of that, the, the architect of that. But obviously it's, it's not something that everyone knows how to use. Uh, I, in fact, I have that HA goal, but I haven't activated it, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, and then there are also our district health centers, because we have our NGO partners. I just heard that Singkong, we also has a, one of the DHC. And then how do we access the district health centers? Because we're also doing evaluation for government on the DHCs. And we find that, in fact, one of the key things that the district health centers should be outreaching to reach the people that do not come to the centers. And if you have read the newspapers just two days ago, the director of audit was very critical that the, the, uh, the, the DH center in, in Kuaiting uh, was quite empty, right? And, and we already saw that problem. We, when, when we did the evaluation, we said that they should be really being, should be outreaching. They should be reaching out to the minorities, the hard to reach, and also looking at the social terms of health. So in fact, that's the ideal uh, site for us to really to look at health improvements. In, in our assessments, in fact, we help the, the ethnic minorities with personalized health goals. Right? We, 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 we look, see what the information, what are their needs are, information about the outpatients in their language. In this context, she speaks Urdu. We also look at healthy cooking classes and exercise that she can join with the family. So these are some of the enabling factors. Right? So you, you enable people to lead healthy lifestyle. So it's not just a question of telling people what to do, but how, how do you actually make it happen? So we, we now hopefully can agree to, to another small check at the second step of the journey. And then uh, how are we going on at the next stop? I must admit the actual utilized health services and lifestyles are a bigger challenge. One day, she tells us that she's going to her first outpatient appointment, but she does not know how to get the interpretation. 
we walked her through the system and made bookings for her. When the service is there, we recognize that the process is not the easiest to handle. Through our Udu speaking colleagues, explain to Shizda how to arrange for interpretation in future and provide tailored requests. We know that that's not enough. Obviously, I think the, the systems need to change. But we know that in big systems, it's quite difficult, right? And, and, and we, we always will have these problems, but really to facilitate the process, to highlight the problems and how we can, how we can make changes to that. For, also, for sustained life modifications, we learned that, it is, uh, that we must be there. Practical and relevant health advice is a must. Thus, we need to be accessible. We've made this possible with simple technology. We had a long, long, month-long journey with Shiza on WhatsApp, uh, together with a few other users with chronic conditions, to share, learn, and build healthy eating and exercise habits. Some of our participants in the Choose Health WhatsApp group are here today. Uh, do chat with them and see how it goes. So this is really then the, the, uh, the issues about reinforcement. Right? So it's just the reinforcement of, of some of the uh, things that they, they could do. And again, from our health assessment, we see that much work is to be done for lifestyle, lifestyle modifications in terms of diet, physical activity, and stress management. So this is the initial information that, that we have derived, and then we obviously need to um, uh, move forward from there. So it's a very, very young project. We are not really too certain about our work in the last three stops of the journey yet, but we are constantly exploring, trying, together with our service users and uh, collaborators. Yeah. So what we've learned so far. First, health assessment is critical in raising awareness of risks, Obesity is a huge issue that we need to handle. We also stress that health assessment has been the tool to open up the hearts and minds of our many service users. So it's not just assessment, because we interact with them. We understand their needs. And they often share with us not only their physical health issues, but also mental well-being and other challenges in life, right? as we know that these are all interrelated. With a strong social work support, and the ethnic minorities outreach teams in our NGO partners, where we should be able to offer holistic care beyond just healthcare. In ensuring the actual utilization of health service and change in lifestyles, we must uh, go on in the extra mile so as not to lose the last mile. As we know from commercial service delivery, it's very real for health service. We must do that extra work to truly connect our users with our health services. Moving ahead, we will work really very hard with our service partners, bringing better health outcomes, particularly through interventions targeting obesity. We also hope our ethnic minorities will be able to organize their voice. For our interventions, we will assess the effectiveness scientifically in order that our interventions could be ad adopted as service models by different health and social service providers. I think one of the features of the School of Public Health uh, in primary care is that we really do policy, we really do research that informs policies, right, to really enable uh, policy makers to, to um, uh, 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 generate, get the evidence for them to make decisions. So in, in policy, we always talk about three types of policy research. One is uh, research to policy, we just do research research is just two policy and it's not acted on. Research of policy, really to evaluate the policies, and research for policies. So in, in, in our school, we, we really do uh, very much in terms of the research uh, uh, for policy and research uh, 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 to policy. So it's a, there's a long list of aspirations, uh, more than you feel you need to read. And of course, it's, it's um, more than a three-year project to achieve this. But at least we can accumulate our, ex our experience and to build up to really reach these goals because the, the research will never be completed, uh, ever be completed. So these are just parts of the journey. Among the long, long list, I just want to uh, draw attention to two points. We hope to approach more male service users and those who are working. We also want to connect better with district health services. And then also to uh, appeal to all of you here to work. So in the longer term, we want to see how we can improve health equity. So working also in conjunction with the uh, Vice Chancellor's uh, vision of the Institute of Health Equity, of which I'm also co-director, to bring health to social services and uh, etc. We are obviously very young. We do not have all the answers. We are, however, determined and visionary. 
When health is our goal, research cannot work alone, nor can social services. Health professionals have a big role to play, but we can be effective only if we join hands with social service sector and service users. I hope the launch will make it clear that it's time for a more transformational approach to improving health of all ethnic minorities and health for all. I just want to end up by showing this slide about social production of disease, because this really forms the framework in terms of how we approach and deal with these social determinants. When you look at, we have society and individuals. So as I said early on, decisions made by, by individuals are really not, not decisions they are in control of. When we have these inequities, there, there is a differential exposure. So they are, because of the living conditions, they're exposed to more health uh, 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 threatening, uh, adverse conditions. And not only that, they're also more vulnerable uh, to disease when it strikes. And they also then have, have a, a also differential consequences of disease, because they're not able then to, uh, if they're sick, if you're, if you're not earning enough, uh, you, you're not able then to deal with the consequence of disease. So it becomes a, a spiral. So this, these concepts will help us look in terms of the, ultimately, how do we actually improve uh, health for our ethnic minorities and health for all uh, in the more structured uh, way. Thank you very much.